Good afternoon, good evening, rather. Happy Wednesday, whatever you want to say. Welcome back to my shop. It's been a week, so glad to be back. Uh, there was just no way around scheduling work and all this last week, so we didn't have a show last week. But this week, um, got three questions on the docket, but opening up the, the whole agenda, if you will, to the chat room. So by all means, if you have questions in the chat room, um, make it easy on me, put them in all caps so I can see them from the rest of the the, the, the chatter that's going on in there. Um, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about sawing and specifically saw length as it relates to height. Um, then we're gonna talk some about the different thicknesses of blades and kind of how that translates into the performance function of a plane. And then we're gonna probably spend most of the time in this session talking about plane function versus like the numbering system and the various sole sizes. Because I think too many people get caught up and what the manufacturers call a plane and think that it only can be used for that purpose. And I wanna make sure we take a step back and understand that choosing our plane is all about the functionality we're trying to go for and not so much the number, you know, number five, number six, number four, or smoothing plane, four plane, scrub plane, et cetera. So that being said, um, let's jump down to the saw bench here and do a little sawing. So I get this question a lot about choosing hand saws. And, you know, I know anybody who's watched my live stream long enough is probably getting real tired of me beating these semantics in place. But this, guys, this is a hand saw. This is a panel saw. I'm going to keep saying it until people stop calling all saws without a back panel saws. Panel saws are specifically smaller hand saws. A hand saw is exactly what you expect. It's as generic as it gets. When you think of a hand saw in your mind, this is what most people around the world think of. Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe in the continent of Europe, they might think of a frame saw, but this is a hand saw. The panel saw was developed later on and it was also called a toolbox saw, specifically shorter because it fit in a toolbox a lot better. The panel saw is anywhere from 18 to maybe 24, sometimes 24 inches long. A hand saw is 24 inches and greater, 26, 28, um, 26 is probably the most common. 26 is also something, or 28, something that comes up a lot. There is a difference between the two and it's not just the length. A panel saw is meant for doing finer work. So it's there by finer pitch. This is a rip filed panel saw and it's 12 points per inch. This is a crosscut panel saw that is actually also, I'm sorry, this is 10 points per inch, this is 12 points per inch. They're filed a lot finer because they're used to, they're used for producing a cleaner saw cut, but also sawing through much thinner stock. Stock that has already been dimensioned, usually, go figure, panels that already been glued up and maybe are being sized, already been glued up and planed and being sized to final size. This is a crosscut hand saw that's filed crosscut, as I just said, at eight points per inch. This is a lot rougher cut, understandably so, than this panel saw. So again, it's not really the point of this conversation. I just have gotten probably four emails today, people asking me questions about panel saws and what they really meant was a hand saw. And I, it's not just semantics, folks. That, that pitch and um, the, the overall size of the saw is very, very different. So the reason I bring this up is, um, this week alone, I've gotten this question four times, but one in particular was somebody who was interested in the hand tool school and asked a really good question of, um, I'm shorter. I, I'm six foot four. So a lot of people see me sawing and they see, oh, he's using a 26 inch saw, but I'm five eight or I'm five four. So I'm gonna need a shorter saw. The fact of the matter is, is 26 inches was the most commonly made saw because 26 inches works pretty well for just about everyone. And you know, there's a lot of thought that says, this distance from your fist, if you make a fist, from your, your knuckles up to your armpit, measuring that distance is really what your, what size saw that you should choose. You know, it's been a while since I've done this, so let's just see what happens. So if I make a fist, I should just grab a, so yeah. I'm at about 28 inches. So ideally, I should be using a 28 inch saw, right? 
Well, the fact of the matter is I have several 28 inch saws and I find that the 28 inch saw is, is too long for me. Um, it works just fine, but I also find that um, if I extend the saw cut all the way, I'm definitely bottoming out. I'm hitting the saw on the ground, which is not the end of the world, and I'll get to that in a minute. But more importantly, when I come up to my maximum backstroke here, um, I still got a fair amount of saw. So if this is a 26 inch saw, adding two more inches onto that, I've got a good quarter of the saw plate that I just can't engage. And honestly, the position where I'm holding this saw right now, even that is a bit too high. I mean, I'm, I'm overextending my elbow and I realize I'm pull the camera up just a little bit because I'm going a little out of frame. When you actually start sawing, it's rare that you pull your elbow up and then all the way up past your back. That's kind of overextending the shoulder joint. More often than not, you're stopping kind of right about there and down. Um, to saw really effectively, they say use as much of the saw plate as possible. But the truth is when you come up to the top of the cut, you don't wanna be using probably the last one to two inches of the saw. And let me, well, let me go ahead and make this cut. So here's the first thing. I'm trying to extend all the way, but you notice I'm at the bottom of my saw strip, but my elbow is still slightly bent. It's not locked out. And if you're sawing and you're locking out that joint, first of all, that's gonna be a lot of wear and tear on your joint because you're locking the joint and then reversing it right away. So you're really not extending the saw all the way. For me, being six foot four, at the bottom of my saw stroke, that saw, 26 inch saw, is still probably two inches off the ground, which makes a lot of sense because when I use a 28 inch saw, I tend to be hitting the ground. So as I'm sawing, the stroke, if I pull it all the way up like I just did, like overextending the, the elbow, you'll see that I actually just pulled the saw all the way out of the cut. And, and that, first of all, it sucks because you have to stop and kind of thread it back into the curve. Or what happens is the little toe stays in, but you end up tweaking it. And this is how more often than not, the toes of saws, if you ever find a kink in a saw tooth line, it tends to be down here in this front kind of couple of inches, or maybe the front third of the saw plate. And that's how it happens when it pulls out and it kind of grabs or part of the toe catches and you push down and it bends like that. There's a lot of force on that saw. So already I'm six foot four. And with a 26 inch saw, if I pull all the way up, that could actually cause me to pull the, the saw all the way out. If I go down to a 24 inch saw or a 22 inch saw, <clears throat> I run into this a lot. If I'm ever sawing down on the saw bench with one of these panel saws, which I rarely do, I often will do that just like that. Just my natural saw stroke, pulling it back, will pull the saw out because this saw is too short in this type of operation. Usually when I'm using this saw, I am not on my saw bench, but rather I'm sawing here at my workbench, either in a, in a normal um, uh, kind of standard sawing method or in an overhand sawing method. And this is the, the way I'm presenting the saw. I'm also standing up quite a bit higher and I'm not gonna pull it out. The point is, even though I'm six foot four and you know, a lot taller than some of the people who email me saying, well, I need to have a shorter saw, the fact is the saw bench height for me and most people is going to be about the same, maybe plus or minus an inch or two. If I remember correctly, let me measure it before I say anything. Yeah, the height of my saw bench is 20 and a half inches. And I've had a lot of people who are quite a bit shorter than me who have told me, you know, I'm 5'2", I'm 5'4", and my saw bench comes to 20 inches or 19 inches. It's very, very common. There's not a huge difference between, you know, I can be a foot taller than you and your saw bench may only be an inch shorter than mine. So the point is when you're fully extended on the saw cut, you're still, in other words, this height that this board is sitting at right now is not gonna vary that much from you know a five foot tall person to a seven foot tall person. Um, that's probably a pretty big extreme, but even then you're talking a couple of inches here. Moreover, 
if really what you want is to be extending to the point where the saw is either touching the ground or getting very close to the ground. This tooth right on the front is dull as dirt. This is not a tooth that gets sharpened. It's not designed for that. It's actually rounded over slightly because it bumps into stuff. This tooth actually serves to protect the tooth behind it, which is sharp. But even when I, let me get my cut started here. Okay, even in my normal saw stroke, when I pull up to the top, again, I've got two, almost three inches of saw plate hanging below here. These teeth in the front, these are always sharp because they never get used. I'm never using, that's just not a normal part of the saw stroke because once I go beyond that barrier, once I really start overextending my arm like that is when I start catching the front and kinking it like that. So if I am saying, okay, I'm five foot tall, I'm five foot two, I need to be using, you know, you're a foot taller than me, you're using a 26 inch or a 28 inch saw. I'm a foot shorter than you, I should probably be using 22 or 24. And for those of you that are gravitationally challenged, oops, yeah, I did forget to change cameras, no big deal. Um, here's what I said. These teeth here never get used. <laughs> so for those of you that are quite a bit shorter, you're going to discover that you'll do that measurement. You'll take that measurement and maybe that measurement says 24 inches or 22 inches. If you grab a 24 or 22 inch saw, first of all, it's going to be a panel saw. It's going to be pitched very fine, which means you're gonna work an awful lot in order to saw a rough saw on four quarter or five quarter, God forbid, an eight quarter board. So yes, you could file down the teeth and refile it at eight points per inch or five points per inch, but you're gonna be constantly pulling that saw out of the kerf. If, again, because I had the camera on the wrong angle, if I'm coming all the way up to the top of my normal saw stroke and I still have two to three inches hanging out the bottom, you can imagine if I went to a 24 inch saw, now my, my saw, the toe has disappeared inside the kerf. And there's every chance as I come back down, it's going to catch and it's gonna cause that thing to kink. So right away, I know there's no way I can work with a 24 inch saw. I definitely can't work with a 22 inch saw. And if my saw bench is about the same height, give or take an inch from someone who's 14 inches, 15, 16 inches shorter than I am, I really don't think it makes much sense to be using that fist to armpit measurement to determine the size of your saw. I didn't need to finish that cut. That's just called OCD. <laughs> I can't have that cut started and not use it. So actually that'll go on the firewood pile. So the point that I'm trying to make is there is a strong reason why Henry Diston, why Simons, why Spears and Jackson, why Atkins, like 90% of the hand saws they made were 26 inches because 26 inches for the human body is the most optimal saw length. It does not matter if you're five foot tall or six foot four. Certainly, you may find, you know, even though my arm measurement says 28 inches, I can get away with using a 28 inch saw. That's really the extent of as far as I wanna go. If I get down to a 24 inch saw, I don't think I have a 24 inch saw. I've used several before, but 24 inches, I'm constantly pulling the, um, the, the toe out of the kerf and I've kinked uh, a couple of blades doing that. So then what happens is you constantly have to kind of truncate your saw stroke. So instead of pulling up all the way, I'm kind of stopping right here. And that's just not efficient use either. You're making this kind of stutter stroke that's just not efficient use of, of the human body. The 26 inch saw, I mean, they made these saws for hundreds of years and sold millions of them, literally millions of these saws. And everyone pretty much decided that 26 inches was the length. So we have all kinds of measures and all kinds of people out there saying, you know, measure this and determine that's your length of the saw. And we've got a number of manufacturers making different saws. The problem is more modern manufacturers today making saws are selling panel saws and not hand saws. Well, why is that? Because a hand saw, a taper ground hand saw is very expensive to make. Case in point, this 
$500 beauty. I don't know, is it 500, is it 480, something like that? This bad ax saw is, a, for all intents and purposes, a $500 saw. It's a taper ground blade. It is an expensive saw to make. So when Lee Nielsen decided to start making saws, they went with a panel saw because a panel saw can be ground to, uh, uh, or filed rather with a finer pitch. Most people today, um, you know, you think about all the woodworkers in the world, the hand tool freaks like me are a very small niche of that. Most people are starting with stock that's already been dimensioned. For that matter, I know a lot of hand tool guys who buy, when they buy their lumber, the lumber they buy, uh, the lumber yard they're buying from are S2Sing the stock or at least skip planing the stock. So the stock is not a full four quarter or an inch, or in my case, four quarter from the yard where I work is generally about one and an eighth inch thick. A lot of this stock is seven eighths of an inch thick. Some of it's dimensioned down to three quarters of an inch or you know, at most 15 sixteenths. So there is a lot more sense to saying, well, a panel saw, that finer cut, is gonna work better in, in a thinner material. But those panel saws, they suck in eight quarter material. Five quarter and six quarter material, don't even, don't even think about it. And that's where this whole idea that hand sawing is slow. Um, because if you use the wrong saw for the job, it's just, yeah, it's slow, it's torture. It takes forever to do it. The point is, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel and think, I'm shorter, I need something different than a 26 inch saw. You're going to find it's more difficult to find 24 inch vintage saws. You may be able to go to you know, Link saws or Garlic and Sons or uh, Pack saws, and they have a couple of different varieties of, of different links. That doesn't mean you should necessarily buy them. Um, basically, modern manufacturers of hand saws don't use that many hand saws, whereas the vintage manufacturers, everybody used a hand saw. Everybody knew how to use a hand saw. Everybody knew what was efficient and what, what wasn't efficient. There's a reason why Distin didn't make a lot of 24 inch saws. They made 22 inch saws really around the turn of the 20th century that became a lot more popular because you started to see more and more of the, tool, the, the toolbox saw kind of idea where the mechanized age started to come into being and more of the heavy duty work was done you know, in a machine shop. But for the average homeowner or uh, the kind of contractor that would go out and do jobs on the site, they needed a saw that fit in the toolbox. And the 26 inch saw was cumbersome at that point. Plus the, the knowledge, uh, the ability, the skill to use a handsaw was starting to fall out of favor. So they weren't selling as many of these guys anymore. So they went for uh, a more approachable market. What we today would call the DIY market, which I know that's got a really, really broad term now, but think of the DIY market in the bad sense of the word. Um, and that's really what the panel saw, or the toolbox saw was marketed towards. So if you are doing, um, you know, as far as using a backless saw, if most of the work you're doing is in sizing already plain parts, then yeah, maybe you get a shorter saw for that purpose, but you're probably not gonna be using it on a saw bench. If you're breaking down stock and rough material or you're sawing, you're breaking down your stock on a saw bench setup like that, you need a 26 inch saw. I don't care how short you are or how tall you are, 26 inches is your answer. That was me preaching, by the way. Let's put this away. Uh, maybe time to build a new saw till, a bigger one. But if I build a bigger saw till, then it gives me an excuse to buy more saws. And I really don't need more saws. So let's look at blade thickness a little bit and see um, where we go from here. Boy, you guys are really quick to tell me to change my camera. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Um, Jeff posed this question on Patreon, and those who know know that I give precedence to my Patreon folks because, well, they're sponsors of the show. So I wanted to make sure I answered this question for him. Um, and those of you who are patrons, this is a uh, great service to get your questions answered. Um, I often will put up a post before the, the show starts or the, usually the day before the show starts saying what questions are you have. And um, you know, I get a lot of the same people asking those questions. I appreciate you guys, but um, there's a lot of people not asking questions and here's your opportunity. So by all means, take advantage of that. So Jeff brought up the point that there is a lot of talk on the interwebs about the thickness of blades 
and how, you know, how important that having a thicker blade is going to give you a better performing plane. This is not false, but as, as with anything, my, my entire philosophy of, well, anything, but woodworking, especially cycling, woodworking, triathlon, web design, <laughs> digital marketing, all of it is you should have an understanding of the why. Um, blindly accepting that a thicker blade is going to give you a better cut doesn't really help you. Um, understanding why it will give you a better cut or what does a better cut actually mean. So the philosophy is a thicker blade, there's just more, there's more mass there and there's going to be less vibration in the cut. So we've got a uh, Lee Nielsen number four here and you can see there is uh, it's, that's definitely a thicker blade than what you would find on a vintage. Here's a Stanley number two. The blade is about half the thickness of the Lee Nielsen. Start comparing that to, say, a Veritas blade, and you'll find that the Veritas blades, they're minuscule, but there's a tiny greater thickness to the Veritas blade than to the Lee Nielsen. At least this one is. This is a pretty old Veritas plane. I don't know if that's changed. Go up to a scrub plane, in this case, the Veritas scrub plane, and this is the thickest blade I own. It's like a third again thicker than the traditional Veritas plane, but you buy a vintage Stanley scrub plane and you'll find that the blade is about the same thickness. And you know, one of the things that guys will tell you as you're rehabbing planes, vintage planes, is you know, getting a modern blade, getting a thicker blade and a modern chip breaker will give you much better performance. And there's guys like Ron Hawk, that have built their careers on it. And there's no doubt that that is true because that thicker blade, first of all, just better steel. Um, the vintage steel and the modern steel, just the technology is made for better steel, better heat treatments, cryogenically treated blades, all that fun stuff makes for just a, a keener edge and a more durable edge. But the added mass produces less vibration in the actual cut. And this is actually uh, recognizable by the sound of the cut. So let's try to get as apples to oranges as we can here. Um, I don't have a modern number two, um, but I do have a modern number three. This is a Wood River plane. I have a modern number four, but that's a little bit bigger and the bronze body has a little bit more mass to it. So if we clear some of this stuff out of the way. Oh, I should also mention here is an 18th century plane. Uh, wooden plane. Again, it is the same thin type of blade, uh, but this one also happens to have a chip breaker on. I'm sorry, this is a 19th century, early 19th century plane. Um, I think I said 18th century. Um, this also has a chip breaker on it, which oftentimes was also called a blade stiffener, because you could take this thinner steel and stiffen it just by putting the chip breaker on the back of it. You'll find the same thing with this vintage Stanley number two. The chip breaker does several things. It certainly breaks the chips, but it also does add additional stiffness to the blade. But if we start cutting with this guy, we've got a certain pitch that we generate. This is cutting a pretty thin shaving. This is a smoothing plane thickness shaving. We come to this Wood River with a thicker blade. I'm gonna to try to get about the same thickness of shaving here. I also need to make sure the blade is straight. How did that get so crooked? Jeez. <laughs> Must've been drunk the last time I used this plane. There we go my high-tech method of making sure a blade is straight in the body, eyeballing it. It's a little bit thinner. There we go. So you listen to that plane, it's pretty quiet. That one's quite a bit louder. I mean, I don't have a decibel meter here, but it's definitely got, there's very little um, rattle. There's very little high pitch in that timbre using this thicker blade. That's got a lot of higher harmonic stuff going on in it. 
it produces a great cut, there's no doubt, but you can hear this just, I don't wanna use the word flimsy, but it's got that feel, that sound of a lighter steel, a flimsier steel than this heavy steel here. Well, the heavier steel, the thicker steel can overcome a variety of scents. Um, if the frog is not machined perfectly, you don't have a perfect mate between the blade and the frog, that thicker steel will dampen any vibration that picks up between the two of them. Whereas this guy does not have that option. And if you, um, fortunately this blade or this plane is fettled well. So I've got a great mating point between the frog and the blade and there is no vibration, but I have no room for error because the blade itself has enough flex that it can vibrate around. And that's that difference in pitch that you're hearing. But the quality of the cut, let me just hit this board. Wood River on the left and the Stanley on the right. And you're not gonna see any difference in the cut quality. My wood, uh, my uh, Stanley's actually leaving a little bit of a plane track there. Um, see my episode on eliminating plane tracks. I just have to, uh, round out that camber. I haven't really put a smooth plane camber, a very radical one on this. I probably need to increase that a little. But again, the cut quality is the same. It feels the same. It's, this is ready for finish essentially because I just used two smooth planes on it. The thicker blade just makes it a little bit easier to get a, a cut that is going to be as high quality as a perfectly fettled, well-tuned, sharpened blade. That's the other point. As the blades get dull, it requires more force to pull up a shaving. More force is gonna create more vibration in the blade. So the thicker blade will actually be a little bit more durable in the long run, because um, as it dulls, there's enough just internal strength, thickness, vibration dampening in the blade that it can overcome some of that. I do find, however, that that failure curve is quite steep. So if, if let's say, <clears throat> just for math purposes, um, 10 strokes of the plane and my vintage blade starts to go dull and I start to see uh, negative effects. I start to see chatter. I start to hear chatter in the blade and it's skating across the board. Um, and we say with 15 strokes, it takes 15 strokes of the thicker blade to see the same effect. What you'll find though is every additional stroke after that 15th gets exponentially worse. You know, it goes a little bit longer, but when it hits its failure rate, it fails quickly. So, um, and that's as scientific as I'm gonna get on that. Um, so there, there is some merit to saying a thicker blade is a good thing. You know, you need to have a thicker blade, but that doesn't mean if you've got a vintage plane that the blade is perfectly fine and you can fettle the, the, the sole and the frog so that you get it well performing, it's not going to be any less. As I said, you might see a little bit of durability issues, but I think I'm even overstating that. You can change some of those durability issues just in how you sharpen and how you refine and hone that edge, you can increase the durability. Um, it's not, to me, let me put it this way, it's not really a factor that I've ever really considered um, to be, oh my goodness, this plane doesn't have a thick blade, I don't want it. Where this becomes a huge issue though, is the thicker the shaving you take, the heavier the cut you take, the more you do want dampening in there. So as we get into some of the four planes or jack planes that are being purposed like four planes, that can cause issues. So in a vintage jack plane like this guy, and this has corners clipped off on it. This is actually my green woodworking plane. It's for outdoors because it's wood and it won't rust. Well, the blade will rust, but you get the idea. Um, this has a thin blade on it and this will chatter pretty easily um, as you get into a heavier cut because there's not as much vibration dampening in the blade. But how we um, ameliorate that is by cutting the camber on the blade, creating that scooping action because that scoop will um, allow you to take a deeper cut with less effort, which is gonna cause less harmonic vibration in the blade. 
Same thing with this four plane. Again, I've got this cut, this curvature cut on it, but the thicker blade now is adding suspenders to the belt here. I've got the curvature that will reduce vibration by making the cut easier and the added mass of the blade, which is going to reduce vibration and allow it to cut heavier longer. And I have um, often talked about this Veritas scrub plane. This was a gift from my mother-in-law for Christmas, probably 10, 12 years ago. And I often talk about how this is not a necessary plane. Like don't go out and buy a Veritas scrub plane because the scrub plane does not need this flat of a sole. It doesn't need all the precision that this Veritas plane offers. Any old random number four or number three can be turned into a scrub plane. That is true, but the thickness of this Veritas blade is really, it's a game changer in many instances because I can scrub and scrub and scrub and this blade will start to get dull and it still cuts like a champ because this blade is so heavy. There's so little chatter because there's no vibration in it. And in fact, this scrub plane does not have a chip breaker on it. First of all, there's no reason to break chips with a scrub plane because you're taking chunks of wood out, not shavings. And the blade itself is so thick, it doesn't need the additional stiffening. So when you're talking smoothing planes, I think the whole blade thickness idea, is kind of a moot point. Certainly tear out can be controlled by reducing vibration, but what's gonna control tear out more than vibration of the blade is the sharpness of the blade. And I think sharp will trump everything else. Next comes the tightness of the mouth, next comes the closest of the chip breaker, then you can start talking about the thickness of the blade, or actually you could start talking about the angle of the blade um, before we even start worrying about the thickness of the blade. Mass is a nice feature, that's why this bronze plane does work really well over its traditional steel plane. That's why some of the infill planes work really well because they're really, really massive. That's the same idea. The plane itself adds a great deal of mass to it. But the thickness of the blade, I think, is, is way down there on the list. To me, it's not going to be a deciding factor. It just so happens, though, that pretty much all the modern manufacturers trend towards a thicker blade. Um, I don't know if anybody in the chat room knows, but um, I have not tried any of the new Stanley Sweetheart planes, I don't know what the thickness of their blade is, but I'm willing to bet it's a thicker blade. Um, the reason that these vintage planes are so thin is it's just, well, it was a hell of a lot cheaper, but the technology also didn't allow for those thick blades. We have a lot more precision control when it comes to the metallurgy of today that we can get these thicker blades, we can heat treat them appropriately, we can, we can um, anneal them, or excuse me, temper them appropriately. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd be willing to bet that even the modern Stanleys have that thicker blade. That may not be as thick as some of the premium guys, but still, um, it, it's not really, I don't know, I don't think it's enough of a difference between a Stanley, a Veritas, and a Lee Nielsen to really make a difference. Um, Jeff says, thicker isn't needed despite marketing minions. Um, no, I mean, nothing is needed. Again, the same thing with the 26 inch saw. The 26 inch saw worked for a reason for centuries. This vintage Stanley, um, and I don't know the date on this. Um, Jim Bodie should be able to tell me, he sold it to me. But this style, this thickness of blade has worked for centuries. And I know lots of people who use nothing but vintage planes and it works just fine. Is it just marketing to say the thicker blade is better? No, it's not just marketing. There is actual, evidence to say that the thicker blade is going to perform a little bit better or a little bit longer. So no, you can't just, you know, and I know Rob, uh, Rob Cosman catches a lot of flack for shilling his, his wares, but the stuff that Rob makes is quality. How he approaches it is, is, is up to him. I don't, I think he catches way too much flack for, for marketing, you know, shilling his stuff because it's products that he owns um, or products that he sells and he gets commission on. We would all do the same thing if we had products that we got commission on. But I don't think, I think, you know, a guy like that has the integrity to know that this is something that works. He's got hundreds of hours, thousands of hours behind a hand plane to be able to say that this is legit. Um, yeah. To, to me, I think it's actually probably, um, it would be a marketing detriment at this point if you started producing a thinner iron because everybody else has gone to the thicker iron. Um, is the iron on the wooden plane not tapered? No, it is not tapered. Um, and that is one of the things that makes it, um, well, first of all, it's one of the things that makes it a continental plane, but also a um, 19th century, not an 18th century plane. It's the, the, the more, quote, modern wooden planes started incorporating the chip breaker. This was really right before, well, 
it was in a time when they were still, they were producing, Stanley was producing guys like this metal guy, and there's still people who were producing wooden planes. Um, there were also a lot of um, woodworkers who were making their own wooden planes and just buying the iron. Um, and it was, it, so they were both happening at the same time. So they were borrowing technology from one another, using the same um, thinner blade, and then relying upon the chip breaker to stiffen it a little bit. Yeah, as you go way, way back in the 18th century, you will tend to find a tapered, tapered iron. Um, those planes get really expensive on the vintage market because they do, they are quite old and they are quite nice. Go to look at Japanese planes and that's a different issue where you've got a thicker blade that's tapered. But here again, now you're going back thousands and thousands of years. The Japanese have been using thicker irons for millennia. So yeah, um, if you want to say that's a marketing ploy, well then the Japanese are great marketers because they've been doing it for many, many years. Uh, what do I primarily use the Veritas scrub plane for? For scrubbing. Um, That's not an easy question to answer in the time we have. I may have to, to uh, relegate that to a future episode because um, I use it a lot for a lot of different things. The scrub plane, the, the, yeah, that's not an easy one to answer. So I would say stay tuned maybe next week because uh, what I want to do is walk through really how the scrub plane and the four plane are used and more importantly, how they're used in tandem. I often become very dismissive and say scrub plane, four plane, they're kind of the same thing, just different sole lengths, but that's really not true. And they have different purposes. The scrub plane is the beast. The scrub plane is the thickness planer of the hand tool shop. It hogs off wood, thicker shavings, chunks than any plane in the shop. Um, the sole really makes it the perfect tool for thicknessing a board quickly. So uh, what I would say is, um, yeah, that's a whole thing in and of itself. And I will, I already plan on addressing that. So I would say, yeah, I'll just go ahead and say it. Come back next week and we'll talk about that in more detail. Okay. What's going on? It's all the, the, everybody's speaking German in the chat room all of a sudden. Mecklenburg for Pommern. Mecklenburg for Pommern. Und Schleswig Holstein. Okay. We're we talking about different makers, I guess. Niedersachsen. Was? Was sagen Sie? No, no, no. no. What happened here? Why, why did we start switching to German here in the chat room? Did I just like flip a switch? Is it like that, um, um, that new vacation movie when he actually turns the, the uh, navigation to uh, Korean and can't change it back? All right, let's move on because I've got a bunch of planes out here and talk about function. Um, I had a question, uh, also a patron, thank you, uh, asking uh, about jack planes and four planes, and I think I've mentioned in the past that they're kind of interchangeable. Well, the reason that I say that more often than not is I don't want people to necessarily get caught up so much in the name. Um, four plane is an 18th century term. Um, Stanley would call it a number six, but is the number six automatically a four plane? No, the number six can be used for any number of things. The point is that the Stanley numbering system, you know, one through through eight being the bench planes, you know, the tiny, tiny little number one all the way up to the 24 inch number eight, those are colloquially known as your bench planes. We have assigned other names to them, the number one through the number four being smoothing planes, the number five being a jack plane, the number six being a, a, a four plane, and the number seven and the number eight being jointer planes. And that makes sense because now you're assigning a function to it. You know, what do you do with a number four? Well, it's a smoothing plane, so you're using it to smooth the wood. Um, where the, the um, confusion, I guess, comes into play is that, that five and that six. You know, what is really the jack plane? Well, it's the jack of all trades. It can be used as a smoother. It can be used as a heavy removal plane. It can be used as a joiner plane. It sits right in the middle. I mean, just numerically, you know, one through eight, it's really close to the middle. It's not quite the number four. And then you throw in all the fun five and a quarters and four and a half, and I'm not even going to talk about those. But the problem that I find is people get too caught up in the number and that name, that smoother, jointer, or whatever, and think that they have to use that plane for it. The fact of the matter is, is any plane in the bench planes could be used as a smoother. Any plane could be used as a joiner. It's all relative based upon the function that you want to achieve. So if I want to smooth a board, 
The function I'm looking for is creating a finish ready surface, eliminating tear out and just making a pretty surface. Well, the smoothing plane, those that are called smoothing planes tend to be the number four and smaller because the number four and smaller or number three has just a shorter sole. And a smoothing plane being shorter, being able to ride through the hills and valleys is going to give you a pretty surface faster. It doesn't have to be so flat because it can go through those hills and valleys and still um, pull up a shaving all the way across the board. I can take this number three and get a shaving all the way along the board, but I could grab this 36 inch long joiner and whew, that's set, that's set rank. Okay, I can get a shaving along the whole length of the board because I'm taking a shaving that's like six times thicker than that. But you get the idea. If I reduced this plane down to take a thousandth of an inch shaving, it would probably take a little bite down here at the end and a little bite at this end and it would skip over the entire middle. The longer the plane, the more it's going to span those hills and valleys in the board and it's not going to be the best idea for smoothing because now um, maybe you just want to remove a little bit of tear out in the middle of the board and now suddenly you're having to level the entire board around it to like NASA tolerance flatness and that's just not necessary. So the primary function of the smoothing plane is to create a pretty surface. The fastest way to do that is with a shorter plane. There's a reason I have a number two in my cabinet and I keep it tuned up all the time because it is my, really, it's my favorite smoothing plane. It can hit pretty much any surface. You can see where I just took that huge divot out of the middle of the board from that joiner. It doesn't want to, there we go. Now it's picking up a shade. But this guy is great. It navigates all the random topography of a board and it gives me a really, really nice cut. Plus, because the, the, the tolerance, if you will, of the plane is based on the depth of cut over the length of the sole, the shorter the sole, it's going to be a lot easier to take a really shallow depth of cut. It's a lot easier to get a thousandth of an inch or half a thousandth of an inch shaving over this tiny little sole than it is over the big giant plane. So we're choosing function over size, over, over, over the number, um, you know, the number obviously dictating the size of the sole. The jack plane, because it sits in the middle, and you know this board is about the same length, slightly longer than my jack plane. So I can use my jack plane to smooth this board, no doubt. It will also make it really flat because it's already, boy, this blade is really, oh. <laughs> I really retracted the blade on this. Um, this will give me a really flat board, but it can also give me a nice finish ready surface. And that's one of the reasons the jack plane is called the jack plane. It's the jack of all trades. It can do anything. So I'm pulling up a pretty thin shaving. It's a little bit thicker than the one I was getting off the number two, but I'm getting a full length shaving along the board. Um, most of it, I have to do a little bit more flattening, but in some areas like on the edges, I'm getting a full length shaving and it's a smoothing plane thickness shaving. So I can definitely use that, but I also can crank up the cut or crank down the cut, I should say, to taking a much heavier cut. And because I've got a longer sole, I've got a little bit more mass, a little bit more momentum, momentum, I can take a heavier shaving and I'm not gonna get a lot of rattle. I'm not gonna have the blade vibrate on me because again, I could take a heavy shaving with this guy, but this skinny little blade, it's not gonna be happy with that. Moreover, this plane is set with a very, very tight mouth. The frog has moved all the way forward. If I try to take a heavy shaving with this, it's going to clog. This has a more open mouth and it will allow me to hog off and take a shaving that's probably 10 times thicker than that smoothing plane shaving. But what am I choosing the jack plane for? I want, generally I'm turning towards it when I've got just medium sized stock. This jack plane, frankly, is a little bit big for this board. You know, this board's about 14 inches long. It's kind of overkill to use a jack plane on it. So if I wanted to flatten this board, do I necessarily need to grab my joiner? No, because the joiner is longer than the board itself. That's going to flatten at such a high tolerance. Um, it's just ridiculous. The jack plane is as big as the board. It will flatten it, but it's going to require more work for me to flatten this board because it's already so short. 
If I really wanted to joint or flatten this board, frankly, the number three or the number four makes a good choice for that. And that honestly is why I have the number three in my arsenal. Um, this is my prime smoothing plane. My Lee Nielsen number four, it's, it's set up to be perfectly um, tuned for that. Very, very tight mouth. It's got that camber on it. Um, my number two, very small, navigates the hills and valleys. It's got a slight camber on the blade and it's got a very tight mouth. Trying to adjust one of these planes to take a thicker shaving means a lot more adjusting. Um, changing the blade, moving the frog back. These don't have adjustable mouths. So that's a problem. The number three falls right in the middle. This is set up to have the frog move back so it takes a heavier shaving. And I haven't put any camber on this. So I can come in with this guy and take a pretty heavy shaving. Let's turn that a full rotation. And now I'm taking a shaving that is pretty much the same as the one that I just took with the jack plane. But because the, oh, that's heavy. <laughs> it's a bit heavy. Because the plane itself is short, I don't have to work quite so hard to get that folding shaving. This is perfectly fine for joining and flattening this face or joining and flattening this edge. So you're choosing the plane. That did pretty well considering I just went against the grain. You're choosing the plane based upon the task at hand and the task at hand is highly relative based upon the board. So if you find yourself in a situation where maybe you like to build boxes and you're using a lot of material that's about this size, there is no reason to have this guy. Zero reason to have that guy. And there's really no reason to have this guy, the 22, the number seven. Both of them are much, much larger pieces. The only reason I have this 36 inch plane, uh, well, frankly, because Scott makes a good friend of mine and I, we were playing around and thought that would be fun to make. Um, I used it when I was making a bed. I had 65 inch long rails and that was the perfect thing for getting a perfectly jointed, perfectly flat edge. The, the 22 inch number seven would have done just a fine job, but this thing was awesome. The additional mass, I mean, once you get this thing rolling, it, uh, it kind of joints on autopilot. So here's a board that really, what is this? 30 inches long, maybe? I mean, this is, this thing's overkill for that, but it's set to take a really rank cut. But man, once it starts moving, you gotta get it moving. Whoa, that's a heavy cut. I mean, bam, that edge is jointed. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic for that. But again, this is, this is overkill. This makes much more sense, this size of board, to go with my 22 inch <coughs> jointer plane. So every plane is essentially capable of doing every job in the shop, but it's just silly, you know, to bring a, you know, a knife to a gunfight, if you will. You know, this is, this is the, the knife and this is the bazooka over here. So I, I urge you to think past the manufacturer's names and not even worry about the numbers. I often joke on, on Wood Talk that I always forget the numbers of planes. Obviously the bench planes are easy to remember, but when we start getting into shoulder planes and rabbit planes and block planes, I always forget the numbers because I never really paid attention to that. I never identified you know, a, a number 52 or a number, a number nine as this type of plane. What I do when I have a task is to figure out how big is it? How big is the board? What am I trying to do? What's important? Is, is flatness important? Well, then I want as long a bullet plane as I can get relative to the size of the board, which takes you back to, do I need to use a jack plane to joint this board? Or will a number three or a number four work? And that's where things like the five and a quarter came into play or the four and a half when people just wanted kind of, you know, this jump from four to five was too big and they wanted to step in the middle. So they got a four and a half or they got a five and a quarter. And it's interesting it's not interesting. It makes perfect sense when you think about in the bench plane series, one through eight, what's the middle of that? Four, right? So really right in the middle is the four and a half and the five and a quarter. And that's the biggest crossover from the jack of all trades to the dedicated smoother. And all the gray area where we think about the borders of different sizes, it tends to fall in this gap between the four and the five, which is why those other weird planes came into being. I call them weird because I don't have them and therefore they must be silly. <laughs> I don't need them. I don't want them. I don't need another plane. I'm perfectly good. So please, 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 please think about what it is you're trying to do. The jack plane 
functions perfectly well as a four plane. The key definer to me for a four plane, what makes a four plane a four plane is it takes heavy amount of material off. In order to remove a heavy amount of material, you need a cambered iron. Um, so to turn my jack plane as I have it now into a four plane, I would want to take this blade and I would grind like an eight to 10 inch radius on the blade so that that blade now look like the blade that's in my actual number six, what I call my four plane. Yes, the number six is a bit longer than the jack plane, but this plane isn't really, the number one thing I'm looking for is not so much the length. What I'm looking for is the aggressiveness and that's caused by the blade. Now the added mass of the six does make it a little bit easier to hog out a big heavy shaving. So I think ideally for a four plane, a heavy removal tool that adds a certain amount of flatness, the number six is a good choice for that, which is why most of the four planes, the vintage four planes, the guys that look like this, wooden planes, they tend to be about the same length. Jack planes, wooden jack planes, are usually a little bit longer than the modern day jack plane. Was there really such a thing as a, you know, there, there were differences. You could say this is a four plane and this is a jack plane, but the jack plane in and of itself kind of, it was interchangeable to the four plane because it was just a matter of popping a different iron on. So th this, is, this is where, you know, I will often get myself in trouble because I'm trying to be as inclusive to everybody and say, you know, you don't have to have a specific jack. You don't have to have a specific six because you can use both of those planes for the same function. You just have to adjust the blade appropriately. You, you know, you've got that camber. And this is really where, what I'll talk about next week, where I've got a heavy camber on my scrub plane and a heavy camber on my four plane. But the biggest difference between the scrub and the four obviously is the scrub is a much more diminutive plane. It's, you know, almost half the length of the four plane. So what's the deal there? And they're really, um, the scrub plane is kind of funny. It kind of defies, um, defies everything we're talking about because it can function in slightly different methods. But the two of them used in conjunction are an incredibly powerful duo. Um, it's hard to say which one is Batman and which one's Robin, but together they are a dynamic duo. I'm a Marvel fan, pardon me. I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to Batman. So um, questions on that? Is that making sense or am I just rambling? Um, I think it's really, really, really important for people to think in terms of why rather than just blindly, this number says I should use it this way. It's the same reason that, you know, you take a guy like Paul Sellers and he uses this four for like everything. He's raising panels, he's joining boards, he's making glue joints with a number four. He's cutting, you know, some joiner with a number four. Um, and, and you think, well, but that's a smoothing plane. He's cutting joinery with a smoothing plane. Oh my God, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. No, it's just Paul Smeller, Paul, did I just call him Paul Smeller? Paul, I know you don't watch my show, but I apologize for that. That wasn't intentional. Um, Paul's a guy who's got a hell of a lot of experience pushing a plane and he recognizes that I have a job to do. I'm gonna choose the tool that's best suited to do that job efficiently. Not pretty, making pretty fun shavings, or I like using this plane because it's pretty and it's made out of bronze. I use this plane because it's the most efficient for the job at hand. Understanding the elements of a plane and how a plane does its job will allow you to choose the right plane based on function, not on the number, not on what the manufacturer tells you is for. Scrub and four plane are more like the Wonder Twins. No, no. So which one's the monkey? Is that the scraper plane? Gleek, wasn't that his name? <laughs> Meanwhile, in another workshop, uh, yeah. Um, assuming the widths of blades is the same, can we swap planes between Stanley plates, uh, planes? Yeah, um, I see no reason why you couldn't do that. Um, again, assuming it's the width is the same, you will find some variation from one plane to the next. So a lot of times that assumption is not a safe assumption. Um, but you know, I guess technically, if the blade is narrower, it will fit, right? But then you, you know, if you have a narrow blade, you've got big wide openings either side of the blade that is a potential clogging hazard. So there's, obviously you couldn't put a wider blade into a narrow mouth, square peg round hole, right? You could put a narrow blade in, um, but yeah, you're gonna have an issue there. Advice between a three and a four for a smoother. Um, honestly, it depends entirely on the type of work you do. Um, if you do a lot of smaller work, go with a number three. Um, but I mean, there's really, 
Look at the difference. <laughs> There's really not that much difference. I mean, granted, some of this is manufacturer, but they are almost identical. What you're finding is that the number three has a narrower blade than the number four. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess you're probably going to find more number fours, especially if you're buying vintage, you're going to find a lot more number fours than you will number threes and probably for cheaper. So maybe I would go with a number four. But yeah. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. Did Stanley, did Stanley change the sole size for the same size planes over the years? You know, I don't know. Um, Patrick's Blood and Gore. Yeah. Matt just, just recommended that. I, I would go to Patrick's Blood and Gore to find that out. He will tell you, and he will tell you in a snarky way, which is wonderful. You got to love that. Um, for small boards, then even a large block plane could be set up as a smoother. Yes, it could, but I don't think you should. Um, Veritas, I have one Veritas block plane. It's an older one. Veritas released like a little wooden knob that you could put on the front. They even have a tote that you can put in the back and you can turn your block plane into a very small smoother. That's not terrible because adding the tote and the handle does make it look a lot more like this little guy. Um, and it changes how you hold it. So the problem with using this, this is really, a block plane is really designed to be a one-handed tool. The form function of really any block plane, Lee Nielsen, Veritas, vintage models, wooden models, they're designed to be held in one hand. This little knob, you put your finger in there, the, the um, what do we call this thing? The lever cap nestles nicely into your palm and it's a one-handed operation. Um, Use, doing this for smoothing tends to, it doesn't give you the same weight transfer. And a lot of times you might find yourself struggling to plane a board. Again, dialing's back to like a half a thou shaving, like I get off of this guy. This body mechanic sometimes will cause you to skip more than this two-handed approach. So if you went with a Veritas model and put a knob and a handle on it, you've changed it from a one-handed plane to a two-handed plane, and you've got more of that control over weight transfer to allow you to get a flatter surface um, um, to be able to get a full-length shaving. The other thing is, is when you go down to block planes, I mean, the, this Veritas is quite massive, and I haven't used them other than in shows real quickly that the new Veritas planes are really massive. But your typical block plane like the Stanleys or this Lee Nielsen recreation of a Stanley, they have a lot less mass than a number four or a number three, a lot less mass. So they just tend to make you work harder. Also missing the tote and the knob makes you work a lot harder. I mean, you can certainly use two hands on this, but it's not nearly as efficient. So if you're getting into really small parts, um, you know, an inch wide box side or something like that, one could make certainly make a case at that point. If, if I were dealing with boards this size, absolutely not, not a block plane. Probably cut this in half and make it about three inches wide. I still would use a smoothing plane for that. The biggest issue is the narrow blade means that you just have to make a lot more passes. So it is, it is certainly, it's a long way of saying, yes, you can do it as long as the board is really, really small. But I still think I would want to have a smoothing plane, even if it was something like a number two. If all I did was tiny box work, certainly, what I would do is have a rabbiting block plane because I've got more functionality with the blade going over the edge and a number two or a number three in my shop. That would be my, the best solution, I think, the best all around solution. You know, number f even a number four, I think would end up being too big for a lot of the projects that you wanna do for joining the edges and things like that. The number three and, and a rabbiting block plane would be my, my bench planes, if you will. But Good question, because it really plays into what we're talking about here, where um, choose the work based on the size of the board. Uh, I may have answered this already, but it says, do I have an opinion on the Stanley 40 and a half scrub plane? Yes, it's a great plane. Um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I, I say that I like my Veritas because it's got a super thick blade. The Stanley is perfectly fine. I haven't used a modern Stanley, if that's what you're referring to. I've used the vintage Stanleys, perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Um, grind the camber and you'll all be good. So, uh, I have to call it 
quits here, but I'll answer this last question. Any advice on scraper plane designs for ease of use or efficiency? You're not going to like my answer here. Sunny, is it? Yeah. Um, you're not going to like my answer because I don't like scraper planes. I like scrapers. I like card scrapers and I like cabinet scrapers like the, the Stanley number 80. But scraper planes, I don't really like. I don't know that they're particularly necessary. The problem, and if you haven't seen it yet, I advise you to check out my episode on scrapers. Uh, I don't know, probably a couple months ago. Um, the scraper plane holds your card scraper or your scraper blade at a fixed angle, right? Like any plane does. The plane, the frog, holds the blade at a fixed angle. Well, that angle is the 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 cutting effectiveness of the scraper depends upon the angle of the burr that you've rolled. So that's why the scraper plane has an adjustable frog to allow you to kind of dial that in and get it right. Um, but they're really fiddly, in my opinion. If I think if you were in a situation where you're using a lot of heavily figured jungle woods, that where taming tear out is really hard to do and you've got to go to a high angle solution like a scraper and you have large pieces of it, like conference tables, you know, that type of thing. If you're just talking about like the figured part of a panel door, a scraper is still going to do a better job. But if you're having to do like the entire workbench size or conference table size, the scraper plane will add that element of flatness, prevent you from creating divots in the surface that would be visible over such a large surface. But really, outside of that application, I just don't find that they're worth the fiddliness. Um, I've used the modern Lee Nielsen one. Uh, I've used several vintage ones when I was working at the museum. And I spent more time kind of fiddling with them. And, and that, that setting, that frog setting I found would change the more I used it. Because obviously the burr would deform over time. Um, you could certainly sharpen it without a burr, like I do a cabinet scraper. But even then, you're still changing that angle is going to change how that scraper cuts. And I don't know. I just find there's way too many moving parts there. So I'm just really not a fan of them. Sorry. I know you were probably looking for me to say which one to, to get. But uh, my solution is don't get one. Get a scraper. And learn how to sharpen and tune your smoothing plane so you just don't need it in the first place. So cool. Well, um, the biggest thing I'll say is... Uh, um, Thanks, because I now have next week already set. We're going to talk about four planes and scrub planes and using them together. And the last thing I will say, um, Sharif, who says, I don't see a lot of attention given to shoulder planes. Um, RenaissanceWoodworker.com slash shoulder planes. I hate shoulder planes more than I hate scraper planes. <laughs> don't see there's any need for a shoulder plane in the shop. So, What is the difference between a cabinet scraper and a scraper plane? Cabinet scraper sets the blade at a fixed angle. The scraper plane adjusts the angle, and a scraper plane is looks like a plane, whereas a cabinet scraper looks more like a spoke shave. It's got two handles on either side. It doesn't have a long sole. Um, well, let me just show you. If the flatness of the board is determined by the length of the sole, you can imagine that the flatness created by this longer sole versus this little sole is going to be very, very different. Totally different form function, different different um, body mechanics in using it. And that is where I think what Stanley was thinking when they came out with it originally was, well, we've got people who are creating hollows in a board um, by using a card scraper or by using the short soled cabinet scraper. So let's create something that functions like a bench plane, but yet has the high angle of a scraper plane. That's the real difference. Um, cabinet scrapers can be set up to cut very, very fine, and they can be set up to cut very, very rough. Um, but that small form factor allows them to navigate hills and valleys, and you can create a hollow pretty quickly in them. So, all right. I got to run, guys, because uh, it's my wife's birthday. <laughs> so I got to go, go, uh, go pay attention to her. So. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I do always appreciate it. And um, tune in next week. We're going to talk dynamic duo, four planes and scrub planes. Good night.